If you've struggled with chronic foot problems like bunions, Morton's neuroma, and plantar fasciitis, you're going to love this week's video because I brought in one of the foremost experts in North America to talk all about what causes these problems and more importantly, how to get rid of them once and for all. Let's get into this. Welcome everyone. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Irene Davis with us and you'll know why in just a second. She has been uh, on the faculty at the University of Delaware for over 20 years. She has a PhD in biomechanics. She's a physical therapist and has been clinically active for many, many years. She's currently a professor of the school uh, at the School of Physical Therapy and Rehabilitation Science at the University of South Florida and is the current president of the American College of Sports Medicine. So she definitely wins the award for the least amount of free time in her life. Thank you so much for making the time to be here, Irene. Thanks. And just a couple of disclosures on the president-elect. So my term doesn't start until June. Okay. And uh, my, my last position was at, actually at Harvard Medical School. So that's where I um, came to the University of South Florida from. Awesome. So yeah. And so you've conducted research, you've worked in the clinic, you've read the research. And so you are the perfect person, I think, to speak to my audience about the abundance of, of foot problems that we're seeing in, in modern society. But before we get to that, I just want to ask you really quickly, why feet? <laughs> what started yeah. you down that Oh path? my gosh. You know, um, I started out in my, my area, my general area is the relationship between lower extremity mechanics and injury okay. and mostly with related to running, but also walking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the foot is the first part that comes in contact with the ground. So, and we have a closed kinetic chain. So what happens at the foot has a translation all the way up the kinetic chain. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, and, and I also think that the foot is highly underappreciated. Yes. So from a biomechanic standpoint, you know, we model often and only until recently, we were modeling it as kind of like just a, a single solid block. Yeah. Um, and there are 28 bones, 33 articulations, each with six degrees of freedom of motion. Yeah. Right. And so it moves in many, many different ways and to model it as a block and to consider it, you know, as just something that doesn't really, it's sort of passive. I think it's really, really short-sighted. Yes. Um, you know, we've got four layers of, there's 10 muscles and four layers just in our arch. Yeah. Um, and those muscles can get stronger and we'll talk more about that. But, you know, that's part of why I was really interested in the foot. Yeah. So uh, agree with you hundred percent. That's one of the things that I talk about with my audience all the time, that the foot is drastically underappreciated and it's massively to our own detriment. I mean, we've got this little structure that's responsible for holding <laughs> us upright. We're the only uh, species that walks around on, on, on two legs a hundred percent of the time. And the foot has an amazing responsibility, not only in that task, but in providing position sense up the yeah. kinetic chain that you were talking yeah. about. And and uh, so I, I love where you're coming from on this. So let me just ask, um, I was reading just in preparation for this, for speaking to you, and, and I looked at an article from the journal Pain, where the researchers dev, delved into all of like, it was over 30 different studies that they looked at with like over 75,000 participants. And they found that the incidence of foot pain over the age of 40 or 45 years old is something astronomical, like nearly 25% of the population. That's correct. Why, why do we have just this massive amount of foot problems? Um, I think it's because we are not treating our feet. We're not using our feet the way they were adapted. Hmm. So that kind of speaks to um, my, my clinical approach as well as my research approach. I believe that the closer we are to the way that we were adapted to move, hmm. then the lower our risk for injury. And if you think about that in terms of um, footwear, for example, you know, our feet were meant to, um, spread, right. You need to have spread in, in the ball of your foot. Mm -hmm. Our feet are really should be tra shaped like trapezoids and not like diamonds, mm -hmm. right. Where the wider part is at the ball of the foot. And yet we take our feet, we squeeze them into shoes that are not shaped like our feet. Mm -hmm. And women are really the, the biggest, um, um, it, it group that, that has this problem because they love high heels and pointed toes. And so there's, that's one issue. So we're not, we've got shoes that don't fit the shape of our foot. Mm -hmm. And then we have, as I said, we've got 10 muscles and four layers just on the undersurface of the foot. And we have muscles on the top of the foot, the sides of the foot, 
And those muscles are there for us to be able to function mm -hmm. without the help of anything, no footwear at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have spent the vast majority, 99.999% of our evolutionary history, barefoot or in very, very minimal shoes. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem. And then you add cushioning. So when you add cushioning, first of all, the more cushioning you add, the further away from the ground you get, the less sensory input you get. But also what people don't understand, and it seems counterintuitive, the more cushioning you have, the harder you hit. Explain so, that. It, it makes okay. sense to me. I have a biomechanics background, but but I would love to hear um, how you would explain that to, to an elementary school kid. So well, it's hard to explain to an elementary school kid, but if we think about um, like when you jump and land in sand, mm -hmm. right? If you're jumping off a table and you're landing on sand, mm -hmm. you're going to stiffen your legs so you don't collapse down into the sand, okay. right? And if you if that were concrete, you're going to flex your ankles, your knees, and your hips. You're going to make yourself really spring-like mm -hmm. because the surface is really stiff. So you're, when anticipating, you run, you're anticipating the hit. Yes. And, 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 and when you're thinking about gait, you want to try to minimize the oscillation of the, of the vertical oscillation of the center mass. So and we're so, trying to keep it as efficient as possible by exactly. standing. Yeah. And so if, if you're landing on a stiff surface, you've got to make your leg compliant. Yes. And if you land on a really soft surface, you have to make your, your, your leg stiff. That's such a great way of explaining it. One of the ways that I always talk about it in the clinic, um, Irene, is, is that if you go to pick up a suitcase and you think it's heavy, Yes. You like use all your muscles in anticipation of that. And that's exactly what you're saying with the landing on sand versus landing on hard concrete and, and, and how we anticipate. So what you're saying, if I say it in a different way, is that because people have this cushion available, they modify their mechanics knowing that the, the cushion is going to protect them. Whereas right. they, would, they would have to use their muscles if they didn't have that. Absolutely. And they, the cushion will protect them in the beginning. Yeah. But as that cushion dampens, sure. then they start to lose that protection. Absolutely. And that's why in runners, like after four to 500 miles, yeah. they have to replace their shoes because their knee starts to tweak. Right. Uh -huh. Whereas if you do four to 500 miles in a pair of minimal shoes, yeah. you're, you're, you don't have any midsole. There's no midsole to be dampened. That's you right. have to train your leg to, to be able to attenuate those loads. So, so what you're, you're saying, right. there's, there's almost like a margin of error that those modern footwear gives you. And then as this, this foam starts to wear out, the biomechanics that you have in place no longer are applicable to the new model. That's right. So you're and almost so what training this function. Right, you're, you're training the leg to be kind of stiff. Yeah. Right, because it's soft cushion, and then yeah. and then as it becomes less and less protective, you've got a stiff landing, and then you end up having problems. And then the other problem that we have, let's think about running. Like when you run in a pair of shoes that have cushioning, mm -hmm. you tend to heel strike. Okay, and this goes back to our evolutionary history, and I would need a whole day to talk to you about all of the different features of our body that really indicate that we were really meant to land on the ball of our foot when we run, not sure. when we walk, but when we run. Yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. And so, you know, when you put a cushion on somebody's heel in, in a shoe, there's a, there's a, a, it promotes you landing on your heel. Mm -hmm. And I have some great video um, that shows a Kenyan runner, the very first time they're running, first barefoot, and they run, they land on the ball of their foot, just barely, you know, sure. just a mild forefoot strike. You put them in a pair of shoes, and the first thing they do is they go to their heel. And they wow. can stride out more um, because it's comfortable. It's Meaning not comfortable. the stride gets longer as you put in that. Stride tends to get longer. And you and you and so really for a given cadence, think about that. You actually get more speed. Yes. The thing is, you pay for it with an impact. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm just going to put my hand up here. If you look at the vertical ground reaction force when you run, mm -hmm. there's an impact peak and then there's a propulsion peak here. Okay. So it looks kind of like a, a glove um, uh, or a mitten, right? When you land on the ball of your foot, this goes away and it's a nice smooth transition. It's a nice smooth curve. So this is an impact that you get every single time you land on your heel. And people ask me, I mean, well, if we're not supposed to land on our heel, why do 95%, and that is true, of, of runners who run in cushioned shoes, why are, are they heel strikers? Mm -hmm. And it's because of the shoe. That, um, and that It's one factor. It's Well, it, nothing's ever just one factor. And I have to say that the faster that you run, even if you're in a pair of cushioned shoes, the more tendency you're going to have to get onto the ball of your foot. 
Okay. Because it helps you to get that energy uh, storage and return from that the gastroc. So you are gonna you're gonna be much more efficient getting on the ball of your foot. So so speed does affect things, um, and then the surfaces that you run in can affect things. But the primary reason that we have transitioned to heel striking is because of footwear. Yes. Wow. Wow. So so let me take it back a little bit because what you were talking about initially was the the massive amount of foot problems and ankle problems that we see in modern societies because we're we're doing things that our feet are not adapted to do and and it sounds like we're also not doing some things that our feet are supposed to be doing now you had mentioned in a in a prior conversation that you take an evolutionary approach to your clinical practice and, and working with the athletes and and the regular day folks that you that you work with how did you arrive at that conclusion because i suspect that you didn't learn it in a classroom that's exactly right. So <clears throat> I, my advisor, Peter Kavanaugh, who was really a, um, one of the pioneers in understanding running biomechanics, had noticed when he looked at a group of runners that an, a few of them were forefoot strikers, mm -hmm. right? Because even then people were head transitioned to cushion shoes back then. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he thought that they were like the, um, you know, the unicorns, you know, they were the odd people out, but he noticed that they were forefoot strikers and they didn't have an impact peak. And I just thought that was really interesting. And I wanted to, when I finished my PhD, I, I wanted to study the difference between rear foot and forefoot strikers. And I got actually went out and looked for a group of forefoot strikers that were harder to find. Mm -hmm. And I noted that they were landing on the ball of their foot, just like these, these few unicorns. And indeed, they didn't have that impact peak. So this wasn't just something odd about these particular people he looked at. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there was a couple of papers that came out on barefoot running. And those papers were showing that barefoot runners land on the ball of their feet. Mm -hmm. And we ran barefoot or in very, very primitive shoes, very primitive shoes that just simply protected the bottom of our feet for the majority of our evolutionary history. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking about, you know, that impact. And I'd also started to study myself and others as well, this impact peak that I just mentioned to you. And in particular, it's the rate of loading. It's the slope of this first rise to peak that seems to be related to a number of running related injuries. So Impacts seem to be related. I'm starting to, you know, my research started to show that impacts were related to injury. Um, that barefoot runners, who, which is the way we evolved to run, don't have, they land on the ball of their foot, they don't have impacts. Maybe really this is the way we were meant to run. And that's kind of how I started thinking about it. It wasn't something that was taught to me. Mm -hmm. And then I start talking to some evolutionary biologists and they mentioned this mismatch theory of evolution, mm -hmm. which says that um, our, when our bodies, when the, our environment, evolves faster or changes faster than our body can adapt, then we have a mismatch, mm -hmm. right? We are mismatched for sitting. Mm -hmm. we, we know that we're supposed to be squat. I mean, we're, we evolved to squat. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I have grandkids now and they can squat for, you know, 30 minutes. I was with them at Thanksgiving. They're just they're squatting. Yeah. You know, they just sit there and squat. We yeah. have it in us. And and in my clinic, we always, our goal was for people to be able to do and sit and hold a squat, like a full squat. I'm not talking about a loaded squat. I'm just saying the range of motion sure. and the balance and the control to be able to squat. Sure. Now, does that mean I think we should get rid of chairs? No, sure. but I think that we have to do things that help to leverage the activities that sort of get us back to the way that we were supposed to move. So I mean, well yeah, so well said. So one of the things that I always do in my clinic on every patient that comes in, regardless of what the issue is, is a full functional analysis from head to toe. Exactly. And it's always compared to a five-year-old. Yeah. A five-year-old passes my test, like you said, your grandkids. Every with time. Flying colors. Yeah. And it's fun for them. And yeah. then you see adults and, and, and there's almost like this weird pattern that goes on inside their head because they can remember a time in their life when they could do it. And they right. haven't tried in so long that they're like shocked that it's so hard for them to right. say, get into a squat or get down and up off the floor or turn their neck all the way 85, 90 degrees to one side, yeah. because we just don't do those things in modern life. So you'll get a kick out of this. One of the things that I, I wanted to do when I remodeled my, my clinic is I wanted to put in a squat toilet. Oh, cool. Yeah. I wanted to, and they wouldn't let me because my, my philosophy on that was, are you fit enough to go to the bathroom or are you not? Yeah. Yeah. You should so, be. Yeah, it should be. You definitely, because yeah, you're going to have some problems if you don't. But, you know, I do think a, a lot of people feel like it's just too far gone. You know, our feet are already deconditioned. There's no use in trying to go back. And that's so not true. Yes. It takes, and I don't know the number of years, but I can tell you that we have changed very little from the first running man to now, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, and in terms of our, you know, the length of our Achilles and our, our arch and all of those things, they haven't changed much. It takes a long time for things to change in our body structure. Mm -hmm. But our environment, as you know, has changed very, very quickly. Yes. Um, and so, you know, it, there, there's, there is this, this mismatch. And the evolutionary biologists have talked about it in terms of um, cardiovascular disease, non-communicable diseases like sure. obesity and diabetes, those kinds of things. But sure. I think it extends to musculoskeletal injuries. I, you know, we th everybody's all about the pelvic, the lumbopelvic core, right? And you know that as well. Sure. You know, every, everybody believes in it. They know we need core stability, whatever that you define that as, but sure. you need to have stability in that center of your body. Sure. I think we need that same core stability in our feet. I think you're hundred percent correct. I, I have a, a philosophy that I talk about with with my community, uh, where I talk about how uh, an inordinate percentage of the population, somewhere around 70% of the modern day population is suffering from what I call posture prolapse syndrome, which is the progressive loss or deterioration of all of the body's secondary curves, cervical, lumbar, and the arch of the foot, which is yes. the secondary curve that's underappreciated, and the corresponding loss of functionality that comes with the loss of normal structure. And all three of those curves, what I've found in my clinical practice is that the curves mirror each other. So there's a certain level of fitness that's required to maintain those curves and the disappearance of any one of them affects negatively all of the remainder and it very negatively affects a person's fitness level and often longevity uh, predisposition for certain chronic degenerative conditions like you were mentioning a second ago. So agree with you a hundred percent that it just feeds that kinetic chain like you were talking about. It does. It really does. Yeah. So a lot of people in my, in my community are concerned with problems like Achilles tendonitis, uh, plantar fasciitis, bunions, um, heel spurs, uh, Morton's neuroma, things like that. How do conditions like those, and, and you don't have to take them all in a chunk, but how do those tie into the things that you're talking about with this mismatch theory of how we're doing things that we're not intended to do and, and not doing the things that we are intended to do in most cases? Right. I mean, I could give you, there's so many examples. So let me start with the first one you said, Achilles tendonitis, and I'll talk about it in terms of runners. Right. Um, so people who run habitually on their forefoot, and there have been studies of this, have significantly stronger Achilles tendons. They have uh, stiffer Achilles tendons. So they don't elongate as much because stiffer tendons are healthier tendons, right? They don't, um, they store and release energy better yeah. than one that elongates. Um, stronger calves, right? Sure. If you look at the statistics of Achilles tendinopathy in male runners, 50% of male runners will have an Achilles tendinopathy in their lifetime. Okay. So you think about what would those, and 95% and of runners are heel strikers. And when you heel strike, you don't utilize the calf in the same way. Sure. You utilize it, but not in the same way. Yeah, yeah. And so you don't have the same demands on it. And so what would those statistics be if 95% if of people were actually running the way well, I believe we were adapted to run? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that would take, would help it. It's not going to cure hundred percent of the cases, but I think it would go a very, very long way. Sure. A plantar fasciitis is one of my favorite injuries to treat. And a lot of PTs look at me and go, you're crazy. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to say you're crazy because it's so widespread and people uh, suffer with it for extended periods of time. So explain yeah. why that's your favorite. It's prolonged. You're right. It's prolonged. It's recurrent. Yeah. Um, there was a study done that uh, after the initial symptoms, um, over 44% of people still had pain at 15 years. So it's, it's very chronic. It's very recurrent. Wow. Um, and, and yet I think it's very simple. So if you think about our feet, um, you've got the four layers of arch muscles, sure. right? And then you've got the, and they're, they're actually dynamic. And then you have this, um, this static, what's well, not, it's, it's, um, it has some elasticity to it, but it's non-contractile plantar fascia. And every time you step, your arch deflects, right? And you put a little strain. Yeah. And it's only a little bit and it's not super fast. I mean, you're, you're, you're the, the plantar fascia is able to adapt to that. Mm -hmm. But if your, your uh, intrinsic muscles, the muscles in the arch, your foot intrinsic muscles are weak, then you're going to get a greater deformation. You're going to get a quicker deformation. So your strain and your strain rate are going to be higher mm -hmm. on that plantar fascia. Mm -hmm. And so what people do, the common treatment for it is let's put them into um, foot orthotics and supportive shoes, right? So you're and weakening the intrinsics even more. There was a study done, I love this study because it's the only study to date so far where they took healthy feet, 
put them in a pair of foot orthotics mm -hmm. for 12 weeks and compared them to a group that didn't get the foot orthotics. And in just 12 weeks and four muscles of the arch, there was a 10 to 17% reduction in the size of the muscles and size, whoa. Is, directly, whoa, size whoa. is directly related. Let's, let's, let's just say that again, four healthy runners. We took them and we put them into uh, orthotics with arch support. Yeah. Or, or an orthotic. Yeah. Yeah. And, and how much muscle size did they lose in four weeks? 10 to 17%, depending wow. on the muscle in just 12 weeks. So anybody yeah, who's been in a cast should be able to relate to that as far as that shrunk up arm or that shrunk right. up leg after being in a cast, you lose size, you lose strength as a result of disuse. Exactly. It's no different than putting a neck brace on you for life. Yeah. And, and most of the people that I see have had orthotics for years. A lot of them have four or five pair. Mm -hmm. I had one person bring eight pair. Wow. Let me tell them which ones they should put where. Mm -hmm. um, we took almost 100% of people out of their orthotics in our clinic. And, 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 and so you said plantar fasciitis is your favorite, which means almost certainly clinician to clinician that, that you have a phenomenal success rate with that condition. And you're saying that you took almost a hundred percent of these people out of their orthotics as part of their recovery plan. Now, these people weren't all with, with uh, plantar fasciitis, sure. um, but I'm just saying in general that you can, it, it sh I feel like foot orthotics for musculoskeletal injuries yeah. should not be a permanent solution. I agree. A temporary so brace, a temporary brace, no doubt. I mean, you have a neck problem, you put a brace on just to protect it, yes. but then you slowly wean them out of it and you strengthen the muscle and you do motor control and all those we don't do that for the foot. We that, feel like the foot doesn't have the ability to do that. And so you need to passively support it. You're, you're so right on the money about that. It's so strange to me how certain rules apply for one region of the body, but then we don't extend them all the way through. Like uh, rehabilitation, if somebody goes for rehab of the knee, no physical therapy clinic would ever release a patient that didn't have full range of motion flexion and extension at the knee, right? They, they would say that that person is not 100% recovered, but yet people get released from spinal conditions all the time without having full range of motion in the neck or the lower back. It's very strange that we have these different rules for different regions of the body. That's very true. I, I hadn't thought about it for the spine because I, I typically treat from the, you know, the hips down, but sure. um, yeah, I can see how that's applied. I feel like in my field, in my profession, it is you know, we have uh, these clinical practice guidelines, CPGs, and sure. um, they, they come out and they they use evidence to support the approach to different injuries. Yeah. And every other injury, whether it's a knee injury, an elbow injury, a, you know, an ankle injury, every one of them included strengthening as a very important component. Absolutely. Plantar fasciitis? Nope. That's so strange to me. So I, I, I have to ask, and, I, and I'm going to put you a little bit in a corner on this question. What do you think of like modern day podiatry that really kind of makes their bones off of selling orthotics? And, and I have patients come into my clinic, and I'm sure you've seen them in your practice, where they're convinced that they need extrinsic support for their body. Can you just speak to that a little bit? Yeah, um, I, I think it's changing. So I agree with you. I, I feel like... Um, in a sense, it, I, I have some really well-respected podiatry colleagues, and, mm -hmm. and I, I think the younger podiatrists coming up mm -hmm. are really looking at this differently. Yeah. They're looking at like a more holistic effect and not bracing the foot permanently. I think that was, I'm hoping that that is changing yeah. because I feel like um, it, it, it it's not any different than, so like I said, bracing any other part of the body permanently. Well, you're 100% right on that. And I don't think there's a lot of great research um, backing podiatry. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they their profession needs to do a better job of, of showing the evidence. Like, why does a five you know degree post in the forefoot matter? Yeah. You know, all of the, even the the because I used to do that. That's the other thing that you'll have to know is I never talked about my evolution from before then, but I. Um, you know, used to in, in the, when I started the University of Delaware was my first position. I was the person who taught orthotics. I was making foot orthotics. I was making three or four pair for your dress shoes, your running shoes. Um, and so, really, I I had a complete 180 yeah. in evolution of thought and talk about evolution. It was an evolution of thought because of what I talked to you about earlier in the in the conversation. So, um, you know, I think that we I think people need to start thinking differently about the foot and that this is a really dynamic structure. I'm really hoping that podiatrists today and that in schools are learning this. Yeah. Um, I know that the foot and ankle um, surgery, the American Foot and Ankle Society, they have 
partnered with the PTs and we've done some um, some seminars and symposium together. Mm -hmm. And they're starting to recognize that this is really an important part of the treatment, yeah. the strength of the foot. Yeah. Um, so I hope it's changing. That's yeah. the, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be Pollyannish a little bit about it and be optimistic, but I, I hope it's changing. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I hope so as well. Um, uh, Morton's neuroma. I, I got a question about this just the other day. Now, this is one of the ones that I love to treat in practice because I consider them fairly easy to treat, you know, with footwear modifications, creating a little bit of space between the, the, the toes and the metatarsals and, um, and, and just teaching those, those people some really simple things to do for themselves. What, what's your take on Morton's neuroma? Same, really pretty much the same. I, I think that the stronger the foot, because, you know, the metatarsals, they shear also up mm -hmm. and down. That's right. I mean, certainly there's compression, you know, and making it wider gives them more room, but also the shear. Mm -hmm. And by having more stability in your foot, you don't have as much, uh, uh, there's no science behind that. There's it makes sense to me that sure. having a more stable foot and a stronger foot that you wouldn't have as much shear. So, you know, we do foot strengthening. You're probably doing that too. Um, and we get them in minimal shoes. Yeah. So they're, again, it, the minimal shoes themselves, we published a study in MSSE a number of years ago now, maybe 2018, 16, I can't remember, but we actually took, and it was with Sarah Ridge. She was the first author. We took three groups of people. One group stayed in regular shoes. One group did a foot exercise program, foot core. And then the last group walked in minimal shoes and progressively increased their steps. Yeah. And we looked at the size of four, again, four muscles of the arch. Yeah. And the obviously the people who stayed in the regular shoes had no change. But the change in those muscles was no different between the exercise group and the foot strengthening group. So what that tells you, is because you know it's hard to get people to be compliant in their exercise programs. You know that, Absolutely. but it tells you that if you can get people just walking in minimal shoes, their feet are going to get stronger. Sure. And so when we want runners to start transitioning to minimal shoes, we start them walking long before we're even going to have them run, sure. just to get them, you know, to to build that to get the foot to adapt. Yeah, yeah, you got to you got to get used to the different uh, impact forces and and get your fitness level up essentially right. because they don't have yeah. the basic level of fitness to. Uh, so you're, foot fitness. yeah, yeah, exactly yeah, right. To walk fitness. before they can run literally. Right. right. Yeah. So, um, one more, and this one is a hot button, uh, especially for women bunions, because I read bunions. a paper and I shared it with my community and it was a lightning rod. And it said something like over 90% of bunions are flat out caused by modern footwear. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, if you go to communities that are barefoot, um, very low um, incidence of bunions. Um, and so I, I just did a podcast with someone about heels, high heels, okay. right? Because I love to wear high heels. I know they're terrible for me and I don't wear them very often. I don't want to tell women don't ever wear them. We all wear them for probably two hours at the wedding or wherever we're wearing them to. We take them off because they're uncomfortable, sure. right? Don't wear them all the time. It's just like, you know, you can sit in that Barco lounger if you want to, but don't sit in it all the time. You sure. can sit in a chair, but make sure you get up and you walk around. It's the same way I feel about high heels with women. Because if you just tell me you can never wear high heels, I, you might not even get any compliance. So I say- Wear them, you know, uh, judiciously. Yeah. Wear them when you want to really dress up. You know they're going to hurt your feet. They, they're not comfortable. I, there's very When someone says I got a comfortable high heel, it's usually not going to be a really high heel because it puts all the pressure on the, you know, I mean, the mechanics, all the pressure on the ball, the foot. Um, so, yes, I, if you're wearing those kind of shoes all the time, your foot is going to shape to it. Sure. It's just naturally going to happen. And you're going to end up with that, you know, that painful area on the outside of your bottom of your big toe, sure. uh, you know, this joint right here. Yeah. And so it's, 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 it just makes sense. Yeah. Um, so yes, she, the, she, the, I saw, I had an x-ray. It was really a good picture of somebody in a pair of sh shoes that were tight yeah. and someone that was in a pair of shoes that were minimal and all, and you see all of the space between the toes in the minimal shoe and the foot is crunched up. The, the toes are kind of angled in towards each other. Yeah. You know, you can see it on an x-ray. So, what, so yeah. What, what are the steps then for this 25% of the population that's suffering with these problems and then going beyond that into what we should all know, which is, I think, one of the things that the dental profession has done better than anybody, which is showing people what they need to do every single day by themselves to prevent the problems before they occur. So there's like right. minimum standards if you want to keep your teeth and gums healthy for a lifetime. And I think that uh, my goal in clinical practice was always to give my patients minimum standards. You have to do these minimal things every single day. They don't take a lot of time, but your life is going to be so much richer and much more problem-free as a result of those things. So if you had to give like 
say three or four steps that everyone could do. I know our conversation today has keyed a lot about runners, but uh, what about for uh, members of the community that are not runners? What would be like three or four things that everyone should be doing regardless of whether they have pain or not, or they just want to avoid those problems going forward? So I think you need to start spending some time barefoot. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you have sensitivity, a lot of people, we shouldn't have sensitivity to walking on hard surfaces. We evolved to do it. But some people tell me I can't even walk out to my mailbox because my feet are so sensitive. Mm -hmm. So some of it's going to take desensitizing the feet. They're supposed to be able to tolerate that. Absolutely. Um, but spend some time barefoot. Start out in the house, mm -hmm. right? Just walk around the house. Don't ever put your shoes on. My feet, I don't have shoes on right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and then when you go outside, start spending some time outside in the yard going barefoot, Right. And then, you know, you can walk walk on different kinds of surfaces, including hard and soft. Yeah. I think it's harder to make your leg spring more compliant than it is to make it stiff. It's easier to stiffen. So it's easier to adjust your leg to, to grass, which is why it feels like it's easier to walk on grass. Harder to make it to, because the, the muscles have to absorb more of the impact. Harder to walk on hard surfaces, but do it. Do it slowly. Do it gradually. Don't try to do too much too soon. Start looking at your footwear. That's my third thing. Um, and making sure your footwear has got the width, you know, nice wide toe box. Um, for women, there's so many nice, cool flats now, you know, that they can wear that are stylish. Um, for men, there's lots of, I think they have options as well, but nice wide a toe box, a minimal shoe is one that you can roll up in a ball, like flexible, minimal. Mm -hmm. um, and women just wear your high heels, just wear them judiciously. <laughs> very, very well said. I always love getting a, a woman's perspective on yeah. high heels because having a man talk about high heels. Well, it's easy for you to say, don't wear them. <laughs> exactly right. No. It's like uh, it's like the every day of a male OBGYN's job. It's just like, ah, you don't have to do any of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I so, mean, I have to say my heels have come down some. Yeah. I mean, I had some really spiky heels and, and I have brought them down, but yeah. So this is awesome. I really appreciate the, um, the, the tips that can apply to the entire population. I really right. appreciate your approach to this stuff. It just makes so much sense. I mean, when you look at the structure of the foot, to even make the argument that we were intended to heel strike is baffling to me. Why would you not use the spring that nature created in that foot specifically for the purposes of absorbing impact. Why would you just bypass that and go straight to the heel? Right. So exactly. I, I just, I think you're right on about that. I love what you said there with building foot fitness and talking about going barefoot a little bit every single day and kind of building yourself up gradually and getting used to the sensations and the differences between being on a hard surface and being on a soft surface, and then really taking a good hard look uh, hopefully an unemotional look at your footwear choices and saying like, hey, does this resemble the x-ray that's scrunched together that Dr. Davis was talking about? Or does my foot actually have space to not create, say, the very types of compression that are responsible for causing something like a Morton's neuroma or a, or a bunion problem? So exactly. um, makes a ton of sense to me. I would love to have you on for a part two at some point in the near future. I know you're super busy at uh, the University I'd of South to. Florida. I love to talk about this stuff. That's I think awesome. the more we can spread the word, you know, foot pain is very disabling. You yes. think about it, you can't stand, you can't walk. That's right. Um, so it, there's some very simple things that I think people can do to take care of their feet. And I, and I agree. And, and that's why I love your approach so much. You know, it's, it's like what dentists did. If you just brush and floss, you're that far ahead of everyone else. And, and you're saying that with the few tips that you gave, it's like the equivalent of brushing and flossing, but for your feet. And you can be right. that further, that much further ahead of, of that 25% of the population that got problems. And if you get out in front of it, you can avoid those problems altogether, hopefully. Exactly. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis. I really appreciate you making the time to come on. Thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much for watching. I really hope that you enjoyed this video and that you'll put the information to good use. If you'd like to follow Dr. Davis's advice and take a big step in the direction of resolving some of these chronic foot problems, I'm going to put links for a couple of my favorite barefoot shoe companies in the description down below. Be sure to check those out. But before you head out of here, make sure to click the thumbs up button and subscribe to the channel so that you're updated when the next video comes out. That's all for now. See you next time.